R.C. Sproul is a respected theologian and pastor of St. Andrew's Church right outside of Orlando. He's written dozens of books on theology and the Christian life. and He founded Ligonier Ministries that's designed to help Christians learn how to live a life of faith in more compliance with the Word of God. He, he's got a burden to help people understand the Bible and follow Christ more faithfully. And when Sproul was asked a question about what the most significant concern, the overarching concern of Christianity actually is, this is the way that he answered. He said, the big idea of the Christian life is Coram Deo. Coram Deo captures the essence of the Christian life. That phrase, Coram Deo, refers to being before the face of God, being in the presence of God. Sproul went on to explain further what he means. He says, to live Coram Deo is to live one's entire life in the presence of God, under the authority of God, and to the glory of God. In one sense, everybody lives Coram Deo. In one sense, everyone lives before the presence of God, before the face of God, because God is aware of everything that is going on all the time. We are worshiping in the presence of God. Everything we do, we're doing under His gaze, whether you realize it or not. But in order to live well in this world, we need to live consciously, before the face of God. It's not enough simply to acknowledge the omnipresence of God and say, okay, I'm living with a consciousness of His presence everywhere. He is everywhere. That's why we teach our children from the children's catechism that God is everywhere, right? Children, when we ask you, where is God? What's the answer? God is everywhere. And then when we ask you, can you see God? No, I can't see God, but what? He always sees me. He he knows where I am. He knows what I'm doing. He knows what I'm saying. That's true, but that's not enough to live what Sproul means, Coram Deo. To live well in this world, we must be conscious. We must be aware. We must be thoughtful about the fact that we're living before the presence of God. Submissive. To his authority. We must live with a view to seeking and desiring his glory. In our ongoing study of the book of Ecclesiastes from the Old Testament, over the last few months, we've learned that the author, whose Hebrew name is Kohelet, which can be translated the preacher, that he examines life as it really is. He unapologetically takes an honest look at reality, both good and and bad. And he tries to make sense of the world. And part of the way he does this is by trying to take a vantage point of the world as if God doesn't exist or as if God is not significant. And so he speaks of life under the sun. So he he explores things in the world from the vantage point of life under the sun without a real regard to God. And what we have seen is that he concludes That if this life is all that there is, if what we experience day in and day out is all that we can hope for, then this life is vanity. (laughs) It is meaningless. It is without purpose. If all we have of this world and this life is the things that we can experience under the sun, then Shakespeare was right when he said life is but a shadow A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Coleth would say, Amen. If life under the sun is all there is. But if the God of the Bible is real, if what the Bible teaches us about God is true, then there is meaning and purpose in life. And though there are still many inscrutable realities that confront us each day, we are not left to the sheer impersonal forces that dictate the quality or significance of our lives. In fact, 
to live with a conscious awareness of God and in submission to God is actually to find joy and wisdom in this fallen world. That's the lesson that we will see this morning in our next study in Ecclesiastes. We're just working our way through this book, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and today we come to chapter 6 of Ecclesiastes, verse 10, and we're going to go down through chapter 7, verse 14. If you're using one of the Bibles that's provided, that's found on page 556 of that Bible. Our text is Ecclesiastes 6, 10 through chapter 7, verse 14. So I encourage you to get God's Word in front of you and follow along as I read it out loud and then we're just going to walk our way through this passage to try to understand what it is God has for us this morning as we've come to worship Him around His Word. Ecclesiastes 6.10 Whatever has come to be has already been named, and it is known what man is, and that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. The more words, the more vanity. And what is the advantage to man? For who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of birth. It's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It's better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of fools. This also is vanity. Surely oppression drives the wise into madness and a bribe corrupts the heart. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry. For anger lodges in the heart of fools. Say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Wisdom is good with an inheritance, an advantage to those who see the sun. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money. And the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. In the day of adversity, consider, God has made the one as well as the other, so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. To live with joy and wisdom in this world, you must live consciously before the face of God. You must be aware that your life is being lived out in the presence of, under the gaze of your Creator. That's what this passage teaches us about how to live well in a fallen world. If we're going to live well in this broken world, then we must come to grips with the reality that every breath we take, every move we make is done under the gaze of our true, living, creating God. Recognizing His sovereignty. Relying upon His wisdom. Submitting to His purposes will enable you to live with joy and contentment in this world that has been marred by sin. That's what Coileth is teaching us in the passage that I've just read. In the first few verses, verses 10 through 12 of chapter 6, he lays down the truth that God's sovereignty rules your life. And it's interesting to see that in those verses because God's not mentioned in verses 10 through 12. He's not mentioned by name. But it is taught to us that God has absolute authority in the world. Look at verse 10, the way it begins. Whatever has come to be has already been named. Now that's in the passive voice. It's saying this is what has happened. The actor is left unnamed. The one who's being talked about is not named. And he says that unnamed actor is the one who is named everything. The very clear implication in Coilet's mind is that God is the one who has done this. 
God is the one who has named everything. In fact, perhaps his mind was going back to Genesis chapter 1, to the record of God's original creation. Because when you read in Genesis 1 and 2, what do you discover there? Well, you discover certainly that God brings everything into existence. But you also discover that God names the things that He brings into existence. For example, in Genesis 1 verse 5, it says God called the light day. And the darkness He called night. He named them. He called the expanse heaven. He called the dry land earth. And He called the waters that were gathered together seas. And then when He created His highest creature, the one made in His own image, He named that creature Adam. And He commissioned that creature to name the animals. To name something in the ancient Hebrew world indicated a mastery over it. Lordship over it. Even to bring it into existence. And the point that Koalith wants us to understand is that God sovereignly ruled over creation and that just as He did that and named the elements of creation so that just as He did that at the beginning, so He continues to do that now with everything that happens in the world. Whatever comes to pass has already been named. The point He's making is this. We experience life as surprise. We experience life as uncertainties. Things that we cannot anticipate. But God has already named everything that comes to pass. He was sovereign in creation. And He's sovereign in providence. That's the point. We've already seen this point in chapter 3 where He underscores the recognition of the absolute sovereignty of God. In verses 14 and 15 of chapter 3, this is what he writes there. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before Him. That which is, already has been. That which is to be, already has been. God is sovereign over His world. He rules over His world. This is the very point the Apostle Paul makes in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, when he tells us that God works all things after the counsel of His own will. God is sovereign in creation. He is sovereign in ruling over His creation. He has absolute authority over what He has made. Which means... He has absolute authority over each one of our lives. Now to underscore this creature-creator relationship, God who created and rules, we who are the creature and are ruled, Koalith goes on in our text to teach us that mankind cannot win against God when we argue. This continues in verse 10. He says we're just dust. He said it's known what Man is. That word man is Adam. It's the name that God gave to that highest creature that He made in His own image. You know what the name, the word Adam means? Soil. Dirt. So, what He's saying is dirt cannot win against the Creator. You can't argue against the Creator, at least not successfully. You're not able to dispute with one stronger than yourself, verse 10 goes on to say. And and then in verse 11, he says multiplying words just adds to the folly of a puny little creature trying to overthrow his Creator. The more words, the more vanity. And what is the advantage to man? You remember the life of Job? Job tried. He multiplied words against God until God finally answers him and says, who is this that darkens my counsel? Who is this? And he begins to pummel Job with questions until Job says, I put my hand over my mouth. I talked about things I knew nothing of. I'd only heard of you. Now I see you. Job realized the truth that Koalith is saying to us in this passage. In Genesis chapter 3, we have a record of a man disputing with God. Adam, the first man. 
He does this first by disregarding what God had said to him, disobeying God, and then by complicating his disobedience with trying to justify it. And it didn't go well with that first man, and it doesn't go well with any man or woman since. The result of Adam's initial controversy with God that he tried to justify himself in was that the whole human race was plunged into sin and condemnation before God. So that now that is our natural condition and we come into this world needing to be forgiven by God and reconciled to Him. You know, you can argue with God. You can try to bring your case against God. You can try to pull Him off of His throne. But it will not go well with you. You can come up with excuses for your disobedience to His commandments. And those excuses might seem very reasonable to you. They might even seem reasonable to your friends so that you get a sympathetic hearing from them. But the more you argue with God, the text says, the more vanity. It won't benefit you at all. Why? Because He's God. And you're not God. Because of God's sovereignty and our own limited mortality, in verse 12, Corinth goes on to say that we have a very limited perspective on life. Listen to the way he puts it. For who knows what is good for man while he lives, the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? You know, we tend to think we know what's best. This would be best if this happens. We, we sometimes let our opinions about our judgments about what we think is good and what would be best if it came to pass, we let those things morph into pontifications so they're no longer just our opinions. Why, if this person gets elected president, that's going to happen. If this person gets elected president, then this will happen. And we take our opinions as some types of factual information that we have from the inside. Cole says, that's just foolish to think like that. <laughs> you don't know. We can't be infallible in our prognostications about what will be good for our few days here on this vain, in this vain life. When we think and talk like that, it's because we forget what God taught Job, recorded for us in Job 8 9, that we are but of yesterday and know nothing, for our days on earth are a shadow. We forget that God is the only sovereign in the universe and that our lives are under His sovereign control. Spurgeon once talked about the sovereignty of God in a sermon as being one of the most delightful teachings in the Bible for Christians. Listen to what he said. There is no attribute of God that is more comforting to His children than the doctrine of divine sovereignty. Under the most adverse circumstances, in the most severe troubles, they believe that sovereignty has ordained their afflictions. And that sovereignty overrules them. And that sovereignty will sanctify them. On the other hand, Spurgeon says, there's no doctrine more hated by worldlings, no truth of which they have made such a football as the great, stupendous, but yet most certain doctrine of the sovereignty of the infinite Jehovah. Brothers and sisters, the sovereignty of God is a soft pillow on which to put your head every night when you go to sleep. To rest in the knowledge that your God and Father through Jesus Christ is ruling and overruling in every detail of your life in ways that He has revealed will be for His glory and for your good. We can know if this is true about God in His sovereignty, because the one who sovereignly rules over us is the same one who gave up His Son for us. The God who sits upon that eternal throne is the God and Father of Jesus Christ. He's the one who sent His Son into the world to rescue sinners from sin. So Jesus came into the world to live under the law of God to fulfill the righteousness that the law requires of us that we do not fulfill. And then to suffer the consequences of breaking that law, which he never broke, but which we break, in order to bring us to God. So by his life, by his death, by his resurrection, this Savior sent from God 
reconciles us to our creator. And the God who gave up his son for us is the God who rules over us. And so we can take great comfort in his sovereignty. We can find great joy in this knowledge that God is indeed doing what the text says he's doing. That he sees the end from the beginning and that he's meticulously governing this world according to his sovereign will. Now, if you do not know this God, if you're not reconciled to him, if you've not come to find forgiveness for your sins against him and you're still estranged from him, living in rebellion to him and his commandments, then the sovereignty of God can be a dreadful thought. Because though you can never win against him, you're still living in rebellion against him and you might simply be trying to go on contending with him thinking that if you could just... Further your argument, make your case. Maybe you figured out a way to justify yourself living the way you do before him. And you think that you're going to get by with that. But the day's coming when he sends the Lord Jesus back again and you will be exposed in your rebellion against God. And on that day, you will come to acknowledge his sovereignty. On that day, you will bow to the one that he sent to rescue sinners from sin. And so if you are not trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, recognize that the whole Bible testifies to the folly of trying to live that way before God. It tells you that you're on a foolish path and it calls you to abandon that way of living. God himself calls you to be reconciled to him, to take him at his word, to receive his son as Lord and Savior, and in Christ to be forgiven and to be reconciled. You see, the sovereign God calls his creatures to acknowledge him as God and be reconciled to him as God by receiving from him salvation that he has accomplished in his son. And you receive that salvation by bowing to Jesus. Calling Jesus Lord. So I just want to ask you a question. Are you bowing to Jesus Christ as Lord today? Are you? Is Christ your Lord? Have you received Him as Lord by faith? Taken Him to be your Savior? By faith trusting Him in everything He did to make you right with God? If you have not bowed to Christ as Lord, friend, God brought you here today that he might call you again to do so. So where you are, as you are, just bow to Christ, call him Lord, receive him as Lord and Savior. If you don't trust him today, if you don't bow to him today, if you live your life to the end of your life without bowing to Christ as Lord, don't think that you will have successfully figured out another way to live in this world, realize, no, the day is coming when you will bow. Because when Christ returns, the Scripture promises, every eye will see Him, every knee will bow before Him, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But God's giving you the opportunity now before it's too late. He, he calls you, He invites you to turn from the way you've been living. And to humble yourself before him. And receive from him grace and forgiveness. To live with joy and wisdom in this world. You must live consciously before the face of God. And that begins by coming to terms with God's sovereignty over you. To rest in God's sovereignty, however, does not mean that you just simply become a, fatal, a fatalist. Because our limited nature as creatures our finiteness and inability to rule the world does not mean that we should just sit back and let the world go and just let what happens happen on the contrary to live quorum deo to live before the face of god means that we not only recognize his sovereignty ruling over us but also that we recognize his wisdom preserves our life his wisdom preserves us in verses 1 through 12 of chapter 7, the preacher uses the word good nine times. Uh, seven of those times, 
It's translated in our version of the scriptures as better. But literally, it's the word good and then more good. Good, more good. He's contrasting ways of living. He's telling us what is better to live this way versus living that way. His point is to show us the way to live wisely in this fallen world under the sovereignty of God. And he does this by enlisting a series of proverbs, practical wisdom that we should take to heart. So example, for example, verse 1, he says a good name is better than precious ointment. Now, that ointment is valuable, it's precious, maybe it's medicinal, but it's something that can be purchased. You can't buy a good name. You can't purchase your reputation. That is something that you must earn. And it is something that is hard won and easily lost. And so it is better than precious ointment. Taking life seriously, he says, is better than treating life frivolously. This is what we see at the rest of verse 1 down through verse 4. Listen to the way he puts it. The day of death, he says, is more valuable than the day of birth. Now, that's contrary to the way we think. Right? We celebrate births. We rejoice at births. And with death, we acknowledge that an enemy has come in and taken a loved one from us. Birth begins life, death brings life to a close. And his point is that when a person dies, he has finished his course in this fallen world. And so in that sense, it is better than to be beginning the course in this fallen world. Verse 2, he says, going to the house of mourning is better than the house of feasting. And again, this is contrary to the way we typically think, right? And wouldn't you rather go to a party than a funeral? And yet he says, better to go to a funeral. What's his point? He's saying that going to a house of mourning grounds us in the reality that death looms over all of us. It is our destiny. And thinking about death and being confronted with the reality of death, it keeps us from living in a fantasy world of thinking that our earthly lives will go on forever. And that's better. That's better than just playing some kind of emotional mind game with yourself trying to put death out of your mind he goes on in verse 3 sorrow is better than laughter this is not the way we typically think he's not talking about the laughter that comes from the rich enjoyment of life but rather the kind of frivolous laughter that's trite that's superficial it's like the laugh tracks that are played behind the sitcoms on tv Ha, 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 when there's nothing funny that's happened at all. It's, it's banal. It's meaningless. He says, far better to experience sorrow than that kind of contrived laughter. The sorrow is letting yourself feel deeply the brokenness of this world. It will enable you to live wisely in this world. And experiencing sorrow, letting yourself feel sorrow, will ultimately work for your joy and gladness. That's the meaning at the end of verse 3. When he says this. For by sadness of face. The heart is made glad. The sadness of your life. Will ultimately ground your life. In gladness. In reality. We don't have to pretend. About things. We don't have to try to trick ourselves. And only looking at the positive as if there is no negative in the world. We don't have to close our eyes to the fallenness of the world. Our joy and our gladness will not be tethered to our circumstances. Our joy and our gladness will be tethered to God. Who rules and overrules. And so we can look at the world as it really is. And yet we can know that our God who is good is ruling over this world. This is why the author goes on to say in verse 4, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. By heart here is just meant the, the seed of personality, the seed of your thinking, your intelligence, your volition. The, the wise person, he says, does not ignore the reality of death. The fool is the one who doesn't want to acknowledge death. Now this is fascinating. In these first four verses of chapter 7, the author has focused on death and sorrow and mourning. Why? Is he telling us that to live a morbid life 
is better than living a joyful life? No. No. What he's saying is that a life well lived will not ignore the reality of the brokenness of the world or the destiny of death that awaits all of us. But rather, we'll be able to acknowledge that and see beyond that to the goodness and wisdom and sovereignty of God and find reason to rejoice. You know, there are many people today that don't want to think about death at all. There are some people that won't attend funerals, some Christians. And they think that by not attending funerals that their life will somehow be better because of it. But do you see that this is exactly opposite of what Ecclesiastes teaches here? The reason is this, that until you face up to your death, you cannot get the most out of your life. You know, death is a paradox. It's an enemy. Paul calls it the last enemy in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That is true. But death can also be our friend. Thinking about death. Not laughing about it. Not pretending like it's never going to come. Being sincere and honest about the reality and the certainty of death will set you free to live well. To enjoy life without clinging to it as if it will be this way forever. It will help you to recognize that even the, the most wonderful experiences and relationships in this world are temporary. Blessings like health. Wonderful. Temporary. Wealth, wonderful, temporary. Marriage, wonderful, temporary. Children, grandchildren, temporary. It will soon pass away. That's also true not just of blessings, but of difficulties, of sorrows. Things like sickness and loss. They're painful. They're temporary. Separation, poverty, enemies, war. One day, all of those evil things in the world will be destroyed forever. And those who know their God, who have been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, will be ushered into a new heavens and new earth where there is no evil thing and where nothing unrighteous can ever touch us again. Brothers and sisters, of all people, we should be willing to think soberly about the realities of life, including death. Because we are certain not only of the inevitability of death, but we can be equally certain that death will not have the final say in our lives. Because of Jesus Christ, we can know that He has defeated death, and in Him we also will defeat death. By his life and death and resurrection, Jesus has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So that in Christ, we can now, with the Apostle Paul, mock death. We can mock it. Death, where's your victory? Death, where's your sting? Yes, we'll pass through it, but that will not have the final say. That will not be our final destiny the author wants us to think rightly about these things not to hide from them because he doesn't want us to live superficial lives he wants us to live real lives with real deep abiding joy that isn't knocked off course by the real sorrows that attend this fallen world well having made that point with these Proverbs in the first four verses. He goes on then in verses 5 and 6 to speak more wisdom to us with Proverbs. Better the rebuke of the wise than the frivolity of fools, verses 5 and 6 teaches, it, teaches us. He says, it's better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fools. This also is vanity. You know, you think about this a moment. He says it's better to be rebuked by a wise person than to be entertained by fools. Well, if a wise person points something out in your life that should be changed, shouldn't we regard that as better? 
Shouldn't we prefer that, welcome that, rather than the smooth, silly songs of fools? The frivolous laughter of fools, he says, is like the noisy, ineffective sound of thorns serving as firewood to heat a pot. They will flare up instantly, but they don't last. Make a lot of noise, but it's really not substantive. He says it's vanity. You know, if, if this is true, if this proverb is true, then shouldn't we learn how to take criticism? Think about that for a moment. If to be rebuked by a wise person is better than to be entertained by the songs of fools, shouldn't we learn how to benefit from criticism? Shouldn't we invite wise people into our lives and give them permission to point out things that they see in us that need to be corrected? Shouldn't we be grateful when someone cares enough about us to try to help us see something that maybe we've become numbed to or blinded to in our lives? It's a way of wisdom. In verses 7 through 10, we just had this this list of miscellaneous proverbs. We're not going to go through all of them, but if you just look at it, you'll see he goes on to warn us against being oppressive and using bribery, how those things corrupt. He warns us against being impatient and proud or quick to anger. Instead, he says, we should cultivate patience because, in verse 8, better is the end of a thing than its beginning. And so something might happen initially and all of our judgments come to the fore and we begin to think, oh no, this means this, this means this, this means this. And we get impatient. And what he's saying is, no, bide your time, be patient, trust God. The end of the thing will be better than its beginning. Further, he goes on and says that we should avoid complaining about, with a, a compl- avoid the complaining spirit that asks questions like these. Why were the former days better than these days? Verse 10. Why? Because patience is a virtue. And it recognizes that God's ruling over the present just like He ruled over the past. And if we remember that, then we will be less quick to complain about the present and to think that all is lost or hopeless. Verses 11 10, 10, verses 11 and 12, he says that wisdom has a great advantage. It's advantageous to us. It's good, verse 11, for those who see the sun. In other words, people who are alive. It's good for living people, especially living people who have an inheritance. Wisdom is good for us. If we have resources to be productive, how wonderful it is to have the wisdom to know how to employ those resources in productive ways. Wisdom, he says, protects us. Similar to the way that money can protect you from the difficulties of poverty. So wisdom serves to preserve the life of the person who has it. Why is that? How can he say that? How can wisdom be a protection? Because, as we have seen in what the book of Proverbs teaches us in Proverbs 9 and 10, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So if you have wisdom, you have it having come to terms with the fear of the Lord, having come to terms with God, having come to understand something about the nature of God and your relationship to Him that puts you on your knees before His feet. And if you see that and you live that way before God, acknowledging He's God, He's worthy of worship, He can do as He chooses to do, and whatever He chooses to do is good, it's right, it's wise, and it is for the welfare of His children. If you get that, and you live that way, then you will come to live with a sense of His sovereign Lordship over you that will build you up and strengthen you in faith in the midst of all kinds of uncertainty. So if you're going to live consciously before the face of God, Coram Deo, then you must recognize that He sovereignly rules over your life and that His wisdom preserves your life. But finally, in verses 13 and 14 of chapter 7, you must also recognize that submitting to God brings contentment to life. Look at those two verses. Verse 13. Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what He's made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. In the day of adversity, consider. God has made the one as well as the other, so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. Do you see the word consider? It's used twice in these verses. 
in verse 13 than in the middle of verse 14. The idea behind that word consider is to stop and to look. It's to come to terms with something. To understand it and accept it. And what he's saying is that we need to come to terms with the fact that God is sovereign over all things, even things that are crooked. And what he's made crooked, we're not going to make straight no matter what we do and how we try to operate. Things that we would normally not choose in this world. Like sorrow, mourning, suffering, death that he's written about. God rules over those things just as he rules over the things that we would prefer. You can't turn this fallen world into utopia. You can't manipulate this world so that this world will give you that which you genuinely long for. That which ultimately you were made for. Days of prosperity and adversity are both under the sovereign control of God. That's verse 14. So what do we do? Enjoy prosperity without making an idol of it. You have good health, enjoy it without idolizing it. God's given you plenty of resources, enjoy them without idolizing them. And if you have adversity, endure it without being destroyed by it. Because God sits upon his throne and he is sovereign over one just as much as he is over the other. What we're being called to do here, brothers and sisters, is to hitch our mental lives and emotional lives to the reality of God so that we can look at this world as it is, not play games with it, pretend that things are different than they are, and live with joy and contentment because we are living with the knowledge that this God is our God. That he's for us. We do this because we can't predict the future. Much less control the future. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Man cannot find out anything that will be after him, he says. In other words, you can't know what the future holds. But you can know who holds the future. And you can rest in him. So are you living Coram Deo? Consciously? With the awareness that you do what you do, you think what you think, you say what you say, before the face of your Creator. Do you regularly remind yourself that all of your life is lived out on the theater that He Himself created to watch you? Are you joyfully submitting to God's authority over you? Do you enjoy seeking and doing His will? Are you resting in His sovereignty? Taking comfort from knowing that nothing comes into your life that has not been filtered through His loving hands as being good for you? Are you seeking to find wisdom that He's given in His Word and live according to that? Are you alarmed by the sovereignty of God or comforted by that truth? Do you fight against it or you take delight in it? Are you taking seriously your dependence upon Him? The provisions that He's made for people like us, for sinners through His Son, Jesus Christ. Are you content to trust God with your future just as you have trusted Him with your past? And Do you really believe? Do you really believe that when God said this, He meant it? That He will work all things together for good to those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Do you believe that? If you believe that, then let that truth be the foundation of your life as you face blessing and as you face adversity. And be assured that as you live by faith in that revealed truth about this God and His relationship with you in this fallen world, that you'll be able to live with joy, with wisdom, and with contentment because He has revealed Himself to you and He has made you glad to be living Coram Deo before His face. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for revealing to us truth about how to live in this world. We confess there's so many things that confuse us in this world, so many hard things, things we don't understand. We oftentimes fall into patterns of trying to make sense in this world, trying to live in this world. 
without being fully submissive to you. And we pray that today you would remind us again what it means to humble ourselves before you, to take you at your word, to trust your son, to live in confidence knowing that you rule and overrule everything that occurs in this world to bring you glory and to do good for your children. Show us how to strengthen one another to believe this, to remember this. I pray for those that don't know you as their God. They're still estranged from you. Would you not, in your sovereign power, open their eyes and reveal Christ in them today? We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen.